Okay, great. So, fire puja, very exciting. If we start with this um, sheet that's laminated, this is just to kind of get us oriented. So, all fire pujas um, are basically the same structure. And so, once you get one down, it's really easy to learn all the rest of them. And they all basically go short round, long round, short round. The two short rounds are to Agni the Fire Devi. And so and so he's kind of like the liaison between us and the main deity that we're practicing. And so the short round, um, it really is quite short. It's just a very small amount, a very substance. Sometimes the teacher or the umze will do this part all by themselves and everyone else will just kind of watch and visualize. Um, I think that because we're a small enough group, we can all participate in this. Um, it's nice to do it if we can, but if you know in future, um, it might be the case that the teacher does the first and the last round all alone. In our case, we'll do everything together, except for butter, because that would be a mess. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So if you look, um, it says Mantra of the Fire God. So, Om Agnya Divya Divya Visha Visha Mashri Havya Kave Vahanai, and then you add the um, special insert down below. So, in the case of the Yamshin sticks, it would be Om Bodhi Vikshraye. See where we're going with that? Yeah. Yeah, and um, then we all recite together for all of us teachers, students, and retinues the interferences to the accomplishment of liberation and enlightenment, transgressions of the three vows, natural misdeeds, inauspiciousness, especially, and jumping down again, interferences to perfect magnificence, unclear meditated stabilizations, impure mantras, all the faults of additions and omissions to the ritual, shintum kurie so ha. And then it gets repeated for each substance. Yeah, so shintum kurie so ha, you're offering into the fire. And when you're offering into the fire, You'll have your dorje and bell tied to your hands so that you don't lose them. Um, but you need to keep your dorje and bell on you, the whole fire puja. And you need to only be saying the words of the fire puja and nothing else. So that's kind of why we're doing so much prep, because I can't just say, stop, you do this, you do that, you do this. We need to just be saying the words of the ritual. Yeah. So when you're offering to the fire deity, and we'll go and do a dry run of this in a couple days, when you're offering, offer beautifully. Don't kind of like chuck it in as if it's rubbish, right? This is like a beautiful offering. Does that make sense? Mm. So each of these things symbolize something um, different. So we have interferences to perfect magnificence, interferences to perfect prosperity, negativities, lifespan, merit, etc. And so if you want to kind of keep this for the next couple days and just kind of have a look at it and get yourself oriented, I think it can be useful so that the practice has a bit more meaning. Um, the middle section, which is where the main offerings happen, which is to the main deity, this one will go for quite a while. So basically you're just saying the mantra over and over again. The mantra you've been reciting the whole retreat. Yeah, and so basically just a continuous offering. And what will happen is I'll have a small bowl in my lap and then you guys will have a big bowl out in the front of the hearth. And you'll basically just take turns taking, offering, and then going around like that in kind of a nice line. Yeah, and we'll, we'll do a dry run so it'll make sense. But basically just one by one offering until all of the substance is gone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the last round we'll do again to Agni the Fire Deity, kind of in Thanksgiving. And um, that'll include um, some extra bits and pieces that um, not everyone will participate in, basically offering um, divine clothes, offering a torma, various things like that. So whenever you see me holding something that you don't get to hold, imagine that they're your hands. Yeah. yeah? So imagine that you're doing the offering even if I'm the only one doing the offering this is your fire puja yeah um, some fire pujas are kind of um, for a blessing some fire pujas are just kind of um, for people to get imprints but this is actually your fire puja to purify your negativities particularly vagueness right um, mantras that went too quickly mantras that went too slowly okay. when you missed out syllables right if you added syllables if you were meditating perfectly single-pointedly with your visualization but actually very grumpy you know 
things like that, right? So the, the retreat purified your whole life of negativities, really. It's a huge, huge, amazing thing that you did. But then during the practice itself, you know, how many seconds go by without an affliction present? You know, so it's really a beautiful thing. And then for people who are offering service to a fire puja, they're really creating the cause to be supported in their practice. So if someone um, is feeling competent and ready to help, it's good that they help because it does create the cause for them to get support in the future. But it's not the sort of thing that you should invite um, looky loos to. Um, I once asked my teacher if I could get a non-Buddhist to help me with a fire puja because I was going to be in a rural area all by myself and the only people around were like my old friends from school. And I thought, well, could they just hand me stuff? They don't have to know what it is or what I'm doing. They're not looking at the ritual. And he said, if they have um, respect for your practice, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever doing this all by yourself, and your only helper can be is a non-Buddhist, it's okay if you get a non-Buddhist helper if they genuinely respect you in your practice. Does that make sense? So that's just kind of an overview. So there's some tricky bits. So now if you want to turn to the, the page with the jobs. unlaminated sheet. But ideally in these fire pujas, if they hadn't done the retreat, they wouldn't be doing the fire puja. Um, what do you mean, helpers or participants? No, part of, you know, people who sometimes, want, you know, they want to come to that fire puja, but they haven't done the practice. It's completely up to the umze. Yeah. Because people like um, Geshe Wangshin often have an open fire puja that everybody's invited to, yeah. to help them, you know, really connect with the practice and to purify negativities and in kind of like a celebration at the end of the year sort of thing. So it's totally the call of the teacher. Yeah. Um, everyone's going to have different views on it. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly it's not something that participants should ever invite other partis other sort of random people to. That's what you know, it's always had to run through the retreat leader. Yeah, for sure. And um, some of it's just logistics, just pure logistics, because if people have never seen one before, then they're probably going to get in the way. You know, but you know your friends, you know the people that will stand unobtrusively and respectfully and do the right thing, and the ones that will get all kind of interfering and up in your face. Yeah. So it's got to be a collaborative decision, definitely always going through the retreat leader. Yeah, yeah for sure. So jobs. All right, so there's a bit about fire pujas on one side, and then the jobs are on the other side. Great. So is the first one sticks? Yep. Sticks. Okay, sticks. This is not my ideal demo because there is a curve. So in your mind, say, don't use one that has a curve. But yamshing should be wood that is not poisonous. Now, ideally, it should be something like a Bodhi tree yeah. relative. But if we were to use our Bodhi tree every time we had a fire puja, the Bodhi tree would be sad. Um, <laughs> so we're not using actual Bodhi tree. Um, although if you have a huge grove of Bodhi trees at your Dharma center, by all means. But um, it's got sap that is like, um, they call it milkwood, you know, kind of whitish saps. Um, Lots of centers use fruit trees because that's kind of your best guarantee that it's a non-poisonous tree if you're not kind of savvy to help with horticulture. Um, but basically what you're going to do is you get your branch and you have to be very conscious of the growing direction. Yeah, so when you have, so you have, it's obvious the growing direction because that's the leaves, right? Um, and you'll get your main length and the way you determine the length is whoever's the main offerer, it's across their knuckles three times. Yeah, so it's one, two, three. Yeah, so whoever's the main offerer. So if Geshe is leading, you just go up with a tape measure, you know, say, Geshe, give me your hands. So like, <laughs> right? And um, so then what you do is you take this and you find where is it starting to be nice and straight at a thickness that is no thicker than your thumb and no thinner than your pinky. Yeah, between those two thicknesses. So you think, okay, it's a bit curvy, a bit curvy. Okay, it's starting to get straight here. So, may I borrow your pen? So about here 
to about here is going to be a good one. And from here to here is going to be a good one. Does, um, does we have a lot of bamboo, does that qualify? Not so bamboo. Yeah, yeah, not bamboo. Um, it's not got the white sap and also sometimes it explodes. Yeah, mm. it yep. right. There's two, two different <laughs> nice kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love that about it. That we love. <laughs> There's two different trees on the boundary. One's a willow and one's something else, and they look oh, quite similar. Good, yeah. And both of those are good. Okay, so. so you're cutting, being very aware of the growing direction. Pan again. And then the growing direction you mark with an X. Yeah, and this is important later because we're going to be dipping that end in the special substance, mm -hmm. and that's the end you offer into the hearth at the end. Mm -hmm. So it's um, so as you cut, X them. Yeah, don't save it all for the end and assume you'll be able to tell the growing direction. Some sticks obviously you will be, and some sticks you won't. So you've got a bit like this, right? So instead of taking this and ripping it off, actually cut it quite neatly so that you're not destroying it. Okay. And this is the sort of thing that you might think, why don't we just do this at the beginning of the retreat so it's all done and there's no stress? The reason is that it needs to be alive. It needs to be alive. Yeah. So we're not we're not doing this today. We're doing this, you know, tomorrow, the next day, and then close to the retreat, we'll do the dipping so that it doesn't attract the ants. So all of these things need to be alive. Um, if there's tiny little leaves, you can leave them. Yeah. So that's yamshing. Yamshing questions. Um, yamshing additions. Fire puja savvy people? Well, at Chinakuni we use, um, we've got some hazelnut trees that don't produce any hazelnuts, and but they, when you cut them, they shoot off into these perfectly straight, all pieces, so if you ever wanted to plant some of those, they're very handy. What are they called? I don't know if they have them. Hazelnut, we do, but they're not poisonous, so yeah, no. Right. yeah. No, we don't have a hazelnut. No hazelnut. Anyway, it's just really good. This is good to know because this is, you know, this is straight, it's acceptable, but the straighter the better. Yeah. yeah, the straighter the better. So, anyway, here's your demo, and I'll pop it in with the secateurs. I don't know if these are still secateurs when they're giant. Anyway, this is a reject. Yes, this is the reject. I'm sure that it serves a function, but not this function. Right? Okay. <laughs> so, Yamshi. All right, next is what on the list? Uh, grass? Yeah. Coil grass. Oh, segmented grass. Segmented coil grass. Now this is going to be called various things in various sedanas, which is why I've put many names on the list, because I'm hoping that at the end of this, all of you will then have an idea how to do fire pujas, and now you are each become the retreat leader in future. Yes? <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so this is the end product. Okay, this is the end product, and this, you choose um, an end that is um, looking clean and tidy and dip it in the special substance, and again, that's the side that you enter into the hearth. So what you do is you find yourself long life grass, and there's a lot of different varieties of long life grass, but it's basically like the horrible grass you don't want in your garden. Yeah, so it's segmented, yeah? And sometimes it looks like it's dead, but it's actually quite alive. So you just strip off some of the dead bits and check is it still got real strong vitality. And so this is how you'll find it when you're hunting for it, is you'll see this kind of dead bits and go, okay, I think that's some long life grass. Yes. And then push it back and see, yep, it's green, it's healthy, that'll yeah. do. So what you want is the longest pieces you can find with the root intact. And sometimes the only amount of root you can keep intact are little wispy bits but you want the roots, because again, you want this alive and vital. Yeah, this is to represent long life. So, you know, these things are a pain, right, to get out of your garden. They're really robust. They're going to survive the apocalypse. So it's a very good representation of um, what we want for our long, long life. So you take two, and they should be all clean and dried. They go root to root. Yep. They don't have to be exactly the same length as each other, right? root to root, and then you just coil them around in a circle like this, and then when you get close to the end, you just wrap them around. 
And there's no particular magic reason for this, except that it keeps it stable. Yeah, so when you're offering it, if you were to offer just bits of flying grass, it would be chaotic. All right, so this is the tidy way to do it. You offer everything in pairs, method and wisdom. You'll offer the yamshing two at a time. You'll have to offer these. These are two at a time, so don't grab two rings. You know that each ring is two. Yeah. So this is the coiled grass. So it's all nice and tidy, ready to go. Done. Any grass questions? Yes. Is there a specific diameter that is uh, like preferred or? For the grass, no, it just mm. needs to be healthy and alive with the roots intact. Mm. That's the big thing about the grass is the roots intact. Um, don't break two, break a long piece and make it into two. If it's a big long piece, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, if you get it too early, um, it'll die. But if you want to be kind of on top of it, it will last in a bucket of water and you need to wash it anyway. So if you want to be gathering some starting tomorrow and putting it in a bucket to stay fresh, that it'll probably stay fresh until the puja. But make sure that it doesn't get sad. <laughs> yeah, and sort of like, <laughs> like long life and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's the grass. Um, now the other grass is kusha grass. And if we lived somewhere that grew kusha grass, we would buy it there. But the way that we get kusha grass is through Indian brooms. There's a few different kinds of Indian brooms you can get at Asian stores. Some of them have like a big fan, and some of them are like this. And these are actually better for puja, because you're going to get more long lengths, and not so many of those short, fluffy lengths. So you will have seen this during empowerments. This kind of grass is what gets offered to you during empowerments. You usually get one long and one short. We don't really want short ones for fire pooches. So this gets disassembled. So we basically just take the scissors, strip it, unravel it. It's a big old mess, do it outside. Um, and lots of little pieces will fall out of it, which are quite useful for kindling, so you can save them for kindling. Um, and that is the grass. So basically the fluffy end is the end that gets the substance, and we offer the fluffy end first into the hearth. We'll set aside 10 of these because we have to prepare the hearth for the fire day. So 10 of them don't get the substance. And those 10 go two, four, six, eight around the square of the hearth, and then two get offered over the top of the fire to create the hearth at the end. So this is all kind of early in the piece, those 10. Um, do you want to add anything? Mm. Questions? No? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And we have what? Greens. That's the straight grass. This is the straight grass. Greens. Grains. Okay, so the grains are as you see here. And the grains, basically, they need to be clean enough that you yourself would eat them. Yeah, clean enough that you yourself would eat them. So if you're getting large amounts of grains from a natural food store, they might be sitting out in bins for a long time and be quite dusty. If they're in a certain kind of country, they might have rats running all over them. So they totally need to be washed and dried in that case. If they are um, all beautifully packaged and tidy and vacuum sealed, um, then it could be that they're actually fine and don't need to be washed and dried, but you have to check them case by case. And even if they're totally clean, probably before you eat them, you would rinse them. So it's good to rinse them. So they need to be clean enough to eat. All of these things should be clean enough to eat. And the various things that we're going to be doing all get um, the special substance on them. And the special substance is the three whites and the three sweets. And so these are um, the very, very delicious things <laughs> um, that were very, very deli delicious historically. And um, it's uh, what? Yogurt, butter milk, uh, white sugar, molasses, brown sugar or honey, yeah, 
and it gets all melted up together. And then some pujas you add also camphor and um, a few other things, betel nut um, and sandalwood powder. Depend so the puja will maybe have additional bits to put in the three whites and three sweets, but that'll be in the sadhana that you're using. But always that's kind of the basis. So it's going to get very sticky. Yeah, so when you're actually offering it, you have to remember this is a beautiful, delicious offering, while at the same time you're going, ugh, ugh, right? So you have to really consciously make your mind think, this is a beautiful thing I'm offering, because your body response will be like, oh, ugh. Yeah, probably, anyway, I'm revealing too much. Okay, so, anyway. so that's what happens um, with the grains, and um, I'm letting you know so that you know how to do it, but I'll actually be the one that does the grains, so that's a job that's not on the list of jobs. I, I'm on, I've got it under control because I've got a kitchen. So, the grains, um, the, there's one that's kind of a variable, which says roasted flour and yogurt. Roasted flour and yogurt um, is sometimes called cooked food. And for some pujas, people will use cooked rice with some sultanas in it instead. Um, the roasted flour and yogurt, the roasted barley flour and yogurt can be made into strips, it can be made into balls, um, whatever's kind of useful for offering into the fire, but some people just cook rice and add the three whites and sweets and some sultanas. The special substance, which isn't listed here except for very tiny, is just a tiny bit of everything else plus fruit. So special substance, everything else plus some fruit in a big bowl. Um, the ghee, this is um, the big pot that we'll use, and ghee comes like this, or it comes in a nice thing like this. Again, usually Asian grocers, um, and it's, it's the sort of thing that if you can't find it, you can use just straight butter. Um, ghee is butter, but it's clarified butter. So clarified butter is more beautiful and pure, so we want to use it if we can. But if you're stuck, you can use regular butter or make your own clarified butter if you've got tons of time and you can, you know, boil it and it all rises to the top. And, you know, if you ever did a macrobiotic diet, you know how that works. So all of this can look very pagan or very bun or very Vedic. Yeah, all of this can look very ritualistic and... Um, that can make our superstitious minds say, this is just some silly Tibetan tradition, it has nothing to do with Buddhism, when in fact it actually has some really profound meaning within it. And if you can ask your local Geshis, especially the ones that have been to the tantric colleges, to give commentary on the fire puja more and more often, it gives you more faith for the practice, because it's actually a very profound practice. So notice if you're having a reaction, like, what does this have to do with anything? Why am I burning food and not offering it to the poor, for example, right? Or um, why am I doing this kind of um, mystical campfire thing when I could just be meditating on emptiness? Yeah, these are normal sort of doubts to arise, and you want to acknowledge them and, and look into them deeply, and then think, but if we keep doing it after all these centuries, there must be a reason. And even if the only reason you can wrap your head around is these are the points I want to connect with. I want to purify obstacles to magnificence. I want to purify obstacles to a complete lifespan. I want to purify uh, anything that will hinder my quick speed in action. You know, just really thinking very consciously, if I am strong and healthy without obstacles, I can benefit sentient beings much more easily. So if at least that. And then as time goes by, you can read more and more commentaries about the practice and it will have more and more levels of meaning for you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, any questions? Yes. Are there any visualizations that you'd recommend to do while offering the substances? It's in the, it's in the oh, sadhana. sadhana. Itself. Okay, yeah. yes. It's in the sadhana itself. It's basically there is Agni there, you're feeding him. And then there's the main deity there, you're feeding them. Basically, yeah, basically. And then they're going. <laughs> right. but it generates special uncontaminated bliss in their holy minds so if you can keep it simple and you can just really try and connect with each one one by one I think that's the best and it's that balance of really connecting with your own personal practice while being aware of your fellow retreaters so just like every other practice you want to be conscious not to push and not to drag to always go the speed of the chant leader 
is really important for staying together. So you might be getting so much in your own world that you're just like rabbiting on at the speed of light, just and you're like totally into it and you're doing a great practice, but you're aggravating everyone around you. So that happens. <laughs> There's also the case of someone who's like really, really in it, very slowly, methodically offering, doing all sorts of beautiful intention, and then the people on either side of them are like, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> we got a flight. <laughs> and the pie is getting bigger. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so we're going to try and do a speed that's not really rushed. We do have plenty of time. We're going to start at 8 o'clock. We've got all the way until lunchtime. Sometimes they only take two hours, leisurely pace three hours. It's going to be plenty of time. But um, to try and just tune in to the, the pace of each other and um, to try to avoid that kind of anxious, too much checking of your fellow retreaters. Are they doing it right? Are they doing it right? You know, try and avoid that. But still at the same time being aware, do they need help? Did they get lost? Yeah, so that's just general advice that all of you know, but just to kind of reinforce it that it's still the case in this case. Yeah, because there's going to be a fair bit of movement. Yeah, and we all do have different levels of health and different levels of vitality, and we will all go at different speeds. So if we can kind of hit the, the middle road with it and um, synchronize, it'll be really beautiful. Um, any other questions or comments or fears? It's not linked to whether you've completed the accumulation? No, um, it is linked to whether you've accumulated your accumulation in the sense of qualifying you for activities afterwards. Yeah. The point of the fire puja is purification, and particularly purification to do with mistakes made in the retreat. If you've finished your accumulation, doing the fire puja then means that you can do subsequent activities like self-empowerment, like consecrating holy objects, those kind of things. So if you have finished all of your mantras and then you do the fire puja, you're qualified to do these extra activities. If you're an amazing meditator and can see everything perfectly and clearly and have realized um, emptiness, etc., etc., it also qualifies you to then give an empowerment. But please, no one do that before you're ready. <laughs> Don't need any charlatans out there. <laughs> right. so, so that's kind of the, what it does after you've finished your accumulation. Yeah. There's differing levels of strictness. Some of them you really do have to finish all the mantras on one seat before you're qualified to do the subsequent activities. Some teachers are a little bit flexible and say if you've done, you know, 80% or 90% and you keep going till the end, you can kind of purify in anticipation of your future mistakes. <laughs> But that's very flexible teachers, and not all of them think that. So just, you know, what your teacher says, make sure you're on board with their logic and their context and their lineage, and don't just kind of decide, because I heard it there, I can apply it here. Yeah. How many sticks do you need? Um, I think it's on there, um, or maybe just the grass is yeah. on there. 108 um, is good, but if you can do more, that's good. So try and get 108. Same with grass. Try and get, you know, 54 pairs. Sticks. Um, yeah, one to eight, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so that's all. kind of like minimum, yeah. but if you if you get on a roll and you find a really good batch, go for it. Yeah. Um, same with the long life grass. It's, it's a big part of the offering, the sticks and the grass, so if you do more, it's great. Um, as long as you just kind of remember that the campfire, the campfire, the hearth is only about this big, and so if you make a giant mountain, then the fire won't be able to consume it all, so, you know, don't go too crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Abundance good. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, along the edges, you know, you'll see the normal tall grass, but if you part it, often there's kusha grass under there. Mm. So you can often find it like going down and drilling down. There's a your key melting. <laughs> And that means that, um, uh, you know, you don't have to do it immediately, but you're, that means you're the one that's on in the morning to bring it down to the fire pooja site all nicely melted. So even if you leave it until then, but it takes a bit to kind of scoop it out and get it all nice. Um, um, so the special substance, because it's so sticky and it attracts ants and things, we're going to leave it right to the last minute, but I'll give you a container so that you can do it. Yeah. With the kusha grass, how many pieces would you do apart from the hearth ones? How many pieces would you do? Two for each person. When? You know, this kush grass we offer during the fire puja, everyone offers. Yeah. How many pieces? In the, in the first round? Yeah. Mm, two to six. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Good person. Yeah, good person. Okay. And then lots in the middle row, and then yeah. two to six in the last. Okay, cool. Yeah. So three brooms is good for a kind of standard size fire puja, unless okay. you've got tons of people. If you're only okay. doing one person, probably one or two is enough. Okay. And for the grains, um, if you're just one person, probably one kilo per grain is enough. Since there's so many of us, we have about two kilos for most of the grains. Um, if you ever have trouble finding the grains, um, you can double up on sesame seeds. Yeah, yeah. Double up. Um, but really try your best to get all of them because um, they each have their own potency. They all each have their own karma. So if you can try and get each of them, that's great. But if you can't, yeah. um, double up on sesame seeds. Then the, there's another piece of all this, which is the fire stick. So at the very beginning of the puja, um, there'll be a tiny fire in the walk at the front of the hearth. And then there'll be a stick. This may be the stick. It feels like it's the stick. Um, it will have a big <laughs> floof of its own kindling covered in newspaper so that you can turn it upside down and it won't fall apart, but small enough that it'll fit in the hearth. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the teacher will make it, sometimes they'll ask the staff to make it, sometimes the other retreaters will make it, but a fire stick is, um, it's important because if it doesn't ignite, then it is a difficult puja. So you get it all kind of all wrapped up together and yes. uh, make sure that it's really gonna burn, so. But everything is really, really dry, so what we'll do is we'll <coughs> make the ground wet beforehand, but certainly have a lot of buckets around because of this close to the building. So just a mindful thing mm -hmm. from that perspective. Don't wear your favorite shoes. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've got a piece of white clothing, um, wear it. If you don't have a piece of white clothing, that's okay. We've got some old katas. Um, because it's a pacifying fire puja, mm -hmm. um, white clothing is good. Mm -hmm. So for the, the nuns, we'll wear just a kata sash because we're not changing clothes. Um, right, so pacifying fire puja. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything else. It'll uh, probably, questions will occur to you over the next couple of days and when we do the dry run, you can ask more. Um, but we'll actually yeah. meet at the site and just go right through the sadhana as if it's already happening and that'll help kind of ease it all. Yeah. yeah. We have some, yeah, some ties. Yeah. yeah do, do we have enough for fourteen? So we can just grab some rags. Yeah, just rags are better than string. Actually, if you've got rags that you don't love anymore, you can just. The main fiddly bit, which is really easy, but it's not easy if you've never seen it, is the butter, because um, if you. If you offer the butter too high, it goes whoosh, and it, cr and it really is quite dangerous. Yeah. And if you offer it kind of in a, not in the correct way, it'll splash everywhere and kind of yeah, create yeah, yeah. pools all around and then fire hazard. All of which you would know just with your intelligence, but if the physicality of actually doing it, um, you might want to yeah. get a buddy to, to show you a bit. So yeah, is there anything that you're wondering about that you want to just logistically? Um, we're all going to be sitting on these chairs for the fire puja, and we'll all have um, little side tables, the red ones, um, out to the side of us to put our text on for when we get up to actually physically offer into the fire. Um, the big, you know, the taller ones are less awkward for the text, but they're actually not so good in terms of um, getting around. So we just need little side tables by the side. I think we're done. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thank it. Yeah. It'll be good fun, really. Yeah, and the trial run, you see, yeah, you see yeah, it's easy. Right. It's really nice feeling too when you've done that. It is. It's cathartic. Is it trial really cool. Mm -hmm. well, day after tomorrow. Yeah, Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Same time. Same time. Same place. Then we'll go together. Okay. Great. Right.